This time round, we're going to talk about an interesting subject. We've talked a little bit about anatta before, and atta. Atta is the idea of a personal self or the identity, and anatta is what would the world be like if I, me, my, mine was not there? How would things change? And that's what we're going to examine a little bit closely today. Anatta and you, dependent origination and meditation and liberating the mind. This is what we're trying to tie together a little bit for you so you understand more about this teaching. The question seems to be, how does Anatta fit into the Buddhist teaching? Does it affect dependent origination? Do these two aspects affect the wheel of samsara that we seem to be caught on, which we'll explain? And does anatta affect meditation? Can the meditation with anatta perspective help to liberate the mind? Well, what is anatta is the first question, atta and anatta. We have to define that to start with. Atta in Buddhism means the delusion which is atta, and it specifically means the false idea of a self. So it is the subsequent consequences we are concerned with because if there is no self, what the, this results in taking everything personally when you are talking about atta, but anatta is the opposite. It is the impersonal nature of everything with the consequence of not taking things personally. Why is dependent origination so important in this teaching? Well, in the text, when we look at this, we had to examine, uh, I had to examine why is this so important for us to learn this piece. And the Buddha thought it was very important. He said in about five different, uh, five or more different suttas that were in the Majjhima Nikaya alone, that one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma, one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. And this statement makes us realize this is pretty important. Well, what do we actually need to know? Well, what we're trying to learn, systematically, we're trying to retrain our mind. So when a feeling arises, we need to see how this is actually happening. We don't need to know why it's coming up. We need to see how the mechanical structure of the feeling arising, being there, and passing away. How does that happen? In the texts, it talked to us about we need to understand the feeling's origination, its disappearance, its gratification, or how you take it personally, the danger of it while it's there, and the escape from this kind of feeling. So two things can actually happen. We have the untrained mind, without any knowledge about this, might think that it's choosing what to do if a feeling comes up. But most times, it's surrendering to a habitual tendency, and it's acting out repeat actions again. See, this is interesting because we actually react more often than we respond in our life. And because of this, we spend probably at least 80% of our lives, if we're not trained about this, we spend that time reacting to whatever happens in our life. You know, one of the things somebody said to me once was, well, what exactly is a reaction? And my explanation to them um, was that, you know, sometimes you can always relate a reaction, you can always relate the reaction to a man and a woman who are married, 
and the husband goes in the bathroom to brush his teeth and he squeezes the toothpaste tube flat and afterwards the wife goes in to brush her teeth and then she reacts because the toothpaste tube is squashed and I told this story in um, Korea and everyone laughed and I told it in Sri Lanka and everyone laughed and this <laughs> seems to be a universal reaction. The next slide shows us what happens with a trained mind. If you've been training with Buddhism, then sometimes the trained mind sees things as they actually are happening and then choosing an impersonal response it begins to release and relax any tension automatically and it slows down the cycle of suffering. It gives you space to respond to what is happening in your life. So what is dependent origination? Well, in the Pali they call this paticca samupada. It's an unconscious 12-link cycle of human cognition and these conditional links also make up the energy that spins the wheel of samsara and we're stuck on this spinning wheel. This is what happens. It goes around very, very fast and so many times in the click of my finger thousands of these take place. So what is a phenomenological view we call our examination of dependent origination a phenomenological view. It, it's taken from a type of psychology that happened in the 1940s. And it, what it is, is possible for you to see what is happening in this process of dependent origination by observing it in terms of one event at a time in your life and one phenomenal event at a time. If you come over to me, I'm going to talk about this just a little bit. Um, this is if someone is angry with someone else. Um, this is kind of the middle approach to looking at this process. The uh, one person will get mad at the other person and say something. The other person will react immediately. and. At first, the person takes this whole experience uh, a very personal way. But if they learn about the parts of dependent origination, then the result can change considerably. Let's look. Dependent origination is composed of 12 links. The links do not necessarily happen in any particular order where you start to count these links, although we see them in books often laid out in a straight line, or we call it the arising of suffering or the cessation of suffering, it doesn't necessarily have to start at the point of ignorance. But for the sake of discussing it, we're going to start with ignorance and try to identify what some of these links are for you. The links that happen are ignorance, formations, consciousness, mentality, materiality, the six sense doors, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies, and birth of action, and then finally at the end, the aging and death of that particular event, including all the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair that lives there. Well, what exactly is ignorance? This is interesting. Ignorance does not mean that you're stupid. I actually had someone from a, another tradition one time say, ignorance just means you're stupid. Well, it doesn't mean you're stupid. It actually comes from the root word ignore. Ignore is a verb, to ignore. To ignore what? What's being ignored? What we're ignoring unconsciously, so it's not our fault. We're ignoring the Four Noble Truths, we're ignoring this process of dependent origination, and we're ignoring the three characteristics of existence. Two of these links are actually what we call potential links. 
we call them this because these links cannot be seen or watched very easily when we're using our meditation vehicle and trying to watch in a smaller way what's happening. Formations that arise simply arise on their own, and there's three kinds, mental, verbal, or physical formations. Consciousness, as the second link here, or third link, if you count ignorance, consciousness is actually the potential for the consciousness to operate within the function of the six sense doors. We take the other links and we try to break them down for you to see them as an impersonal links which have nothing to do with you controlling anything or getting involved and the personal links which are the links you try to manage and control. The first set of links are mentality, materiality, the sixth sense doors, contact, and feeling. Mentality, materiality, simply the simplest way to understand it in relationship to what we're doing is to say that the material part of this sense door of the ear is the elemental part of the ear. That is the material part of it. And the mentality is the mental process for the ear to hear. Or the eye, the mental material eye is the material part of the materiality and the mentality part of the eye is the mental function that helps the eye to operate. And this is the way it works with all six of the sense do doors. Your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body, and your mind. The six sense doors are just what we just reviewed. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, which are the external bases, and the internal base of the mind. For contact to happen, it works the same with each one of these six sense doors. If the eye sees, the eye first has the internal eye, which sees forms externally. Then, eye consciousness arises in the meeting of those three pieces make eye contact happen. This works the same way with the ear, meeting sound, and ear consciousness. That way forms ear contact. With the nose, odors, and nose consciousness, nose contact, and the tongue, flavors, and tongue consciousness is tongue contact and on down through the sense doors. Once contact happens, what happens next is feeling arises. Feeling is one of three kinds. The first kind is painful, second kind is pleasant, third kind can be neither painful nor pleasant. Now what we have to do is look at the personal links. We move over and see the red links, and we have craving, clinging, habitual tendencies or f habitual reactions, and the birth of action, and aging and death of each one of the events. When craving happens, all of a sudden it gets personal. I don't like it. I like it. This is what's happening. With craving, Remember, it always manifests as tension and tightness in body or in mind as it comes up. It's the I like it or I don't like it mind that shows up. With craving as condition, clinging arises. And the clinging, once again, has me personally involved. I don't like it because all of the stories, all of the ideas and concepts why I don't like it. Most people can relate to this because if you go out and experience your day, something will happen, you don't like it, and suddenly you'll find yourself thinking about why you don't like it. Habitual tendencies or habitual reactions, when they come up, right after you say, I don't like it because, what happens is a habitual reaction card is sitting in your head in a private little library all your own. Your 
environment, the way you grew up, set up your library, so you have a pat reaction of how you're going to respond, like with the toothpaste tube. It was automatic. So these habitual reactions live in your library. And once you choose a card, you have to give birth to that action. So you give birth to the reaction in the situation, and that's the birth of action. The birth of action can actually be a mental reaction, a verbal reaction, or a physical reaction. And then at the end, aging and death, the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair of the situation happens in the event. So this is the entire cycle. The difference between the blue links, which are impersonal links, and the red links that are personal links gives you an idea of the power of anatta. Atta is, anatta sits in the impersonal links, those parts of the body which just operate, and you have nothing to do with it at all. You don't control what you see, control what you hear, control what you smell, taste, or touch. But when you go over and consider the reaction in craving, craving can't happen unless I like or I don't like. And the story can't happen about why you don't like unless I, 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 I is in there. So this is the driving force that's behind all of this. Can you see the links in life? Well, you can see the links in life. People often realize that there's seven of these links during meditation, and then if they watch closely, they can notice how they are happening within any event in life at a time. So you can see how anger happens between two people. What's actually happening if you watch closely when someone's going through grief? If you see someone with depression, you can actually see where the depression is triggered and how the person grabs a hold of it and continues on with it. You can notice anxiety and panic attacks, specifically how they occur, and you can see fear or any other emotional difficulty that's arising within the human mind. So this is getting pretty useful. But why are you caught on this? Why is it that this cycle keeps going around and around? It's because it's moving so incredibly fast that we can't do anything about it unless we understand how precisely it works. It's because you're ignoring this process and therefore you are taking everything personally and this puts a huge weight upon your shoulders each time it happens. We're not really to blame. Nobody can point a finger at us because one thing about this system, nobody taught it to us. Nobody told us about this human process. So the point of truth here is nothing happens to us. Everything is happening from us. This point is priceless. It's not just in Buddhism that they know this. They found this in other places too. But our perspective has a lot to do with how we translate our experience. This is important to understand. We're not helpless if we understand how this works. So what exactly turns the wheel? Well, the personal links initiate a driving force in this cycle that turns the wheel of samsara. You can learn to reduce the tension yourself simply by following the practice that we showed you earlier. The point of truth here is what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. So we know that if you decide to get up and be happy in the morning, probably the rest of your morning will be happy. But if you get up and markedly embrace depression or sadness, it can be overwhelming for the rest of the day. So what you think and you ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind. We know that mind can be retrained. It's as much a small child as one of our children. We can just sort of retrain the mind, which is a term we hear all the time in Buddhism, through systematically using a, a training system. 
Look at how the wheel moves. I want to do this real quickly for you. We've done this before on one of our other talks. But what makes this wheel turn is just like putting the key in the ignition of the car and making contact. When you turn the key, the engine starts, and that's feeling. When you put the car in first gear, it jerks the car forward, and that arising tension is craving. Second gear speeds up the car, you get involved with the driving, and you're out of the present moment. And you're clinging to where you're going to get to and probably thinking more about your destination than driving. In third gear, you choose your time to the destination. You're thinking about that constantly. And your habitual tendency is to start to try to get there as quickly as possible, especially in Asia. <laughs> And fourth gear moves the car faster down onto the highway, and that's the birth of action. And then finally, you're on the highway somewhere, and you run out of gas. And that was aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, because here we are on the side of the road, all alone, with no gas. Point of truth. The energy builds up when the personal links move into action. So how can we let go of the tension, let go of the damaging emotions, get off this wheel that keeps turning, and become happier? The solution that the Buddha gave us was mind development. His solution was to release the atta links and move into an anatta perspective. Let go of the personal links. Move into an impersonal mode. For modern people, this is like a new kind of board game. Go out in life and just decide for the day, I'm not going to take anything personally anymore. So by practicing this kind of mind development, or bhavana, you are using right effort in the Eightfold Path. And this right effort is to recognize whenever an unwholesome tendency comes in your mind with tension and tightness, to release and relax that tension and tightness, to re-smile and then return over to whatever it is you're doing in your life. I don't care if you're walking, you're hiking, you're going through the monuments. I don't care if you're riding a bike or embracing yourself to ride a three-wheeler. <laughs> I'm not sure what you can do when any time you get upset, all you have to do is recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, and repeat when it's needed. That is retraining mind in a cycle way. So what you're doing, basically, is wholesome to unwholesome to wholesome. This is what you're playing with. But when I tell you that, you have to know and remember what wholesome is and what unwholesome is. Your unwholesome mind state is tension and tightness in mind and body. It's what causes you all the disease. And your wholesome mind state is no tension or tightness in the body, and that's what sets you free. We already talked about the step of right effort. That's your practice. One more time, just recognize the tension and tightness. Release and relax it. Let it be there. It's going to pass away. It's arisen. It's there. It'll pass away, I promise. Re-smile, return, come back, and repeat, and keep smiling. The result of the meditation is that it really relaxes and it opens up your mind. We impersonally begin to see things as they really are. We let go of the tension from assumptions, opinions, habitual, personal reactions, from concepts that caused us so much suffering. And gradually, we identify and eliminate these personal links, and we discover a new balance in life we begin to smile more often. Essentially, the Buddha spoke of a desired and measurable outcome. So he was pretty scientific. He told us how we should train in the Kakachupama Sutta, the simile of the saw. When others address you, their speech may be true or untrue, timely or untimely, true or false, gentle or harsh, connected with good or connected with harm, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. 
we should train thus, our mind should remain unaffected, and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare, with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with that person, we shall abide pervading an all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill will. This is how you should train. So he's telling you right there what it is your results should be. So now comes the time. What do we think we know right now? Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in mind and in body. Craving is the atta view of I don't like it or I like it mind where it takes us away from the present moment. Let's not go too far and say, well, I better not feel anything anymore because I might like it or not like it, and then that wouldn't be Buddhist. We can't do that. But we can recognize that when we get personal about things, that's where tension and tightness comes from. Clinging is the story about why I don't like something. The tension triggers your habitual reactions. The birth of reaction is what moves this wheel of samsara so fast. So in meditation and in life, we try to remember to recognize the tension, release, relax, re-smile, and return to our task, and repeat as needed this practice. And as we let go of the tension, we let go of the craving and the clinging, and we let go of suffering. By just letting things be as they are, adopting the impersonal perspective, relief is going to happen. This practice can become a routine meditation anywhere, anytime in daily life. You can just keep it in your mind. Recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. By doing this practice, you're reclaiming your initial lightness of being. The links we're abandoning are ignorance, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, the reactions, and much of the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. The links that we continue to live with as we develop our practice are we still have formations, consciousness, mentality, materiality, the six sense doors, and contact still happens. Feeling comes up, and then as we develop, we develop compassionate responses for whatever is going on in our life. Aging and death of the event is happening, but there's no more suffering. Less and less is what happens. And thus we experience the end of this whole mass of suffering eventually, and now we naturally tend towards compassion. So I guess what I want to say to you in closing is thanks for listening. And you need to remember your smile and perspective is what lightens up your world. To make a smile priceless, you have to give it away. Always remember, the more smiles that you give, the happier that you will become in the future. We tried to get across to you as much as we possibly could about this practice and how simple it really is. I just always want you to remember one thing. Your smile can help the person in front of you, beside you, even behind you if they've got a mirror. <laughs> so your smile and your perspective is what you have to lighten up your world. It doesn't cost anything. And remember one thing. When you have a smile and you give it away, that's what makes it priceless. Thanks.